All righty. One thing I like about the the printed word is you can increase the font. <laughs> oh man, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. There you go. Uh, let's pray. Lord, we just um I thank you for this uh time that we get to continue in worship of you, Lord, and um we get to see your word and not only see it, Lord, but feel it and have it fill us. Lord, as we come before you this morning, help, help us to have a heart like Mary in this story. Lord, help us to not be like Judas in this story. Lord, show us the way that you want us to act. Lord, let us just um, be in love with you for what you've done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we are talking today about the story of Mary anointing Jesus with oil. The story can be found in Matthew 26. It can also be found in Mark 14. And I believe, well, there is another anointing in Luke. And some say that it's the same, and some say that it's a different anointing. I believe that it's a different anointing than the one we're talking about today. Uh, but there is another anointing of oil in Luke. So it's uh, Matthew 26, Mark 14, and John chapter 12. And I'll read John chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. It says here, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom now had, he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for three hundred denarii and given to the poor? This he said not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and that he had the money box, and he used to take what was put into it. But Jesus said, Let her alone, she has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that, that they might also see Lazarus, who he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on the account of him many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I, I'm excited about this week's sermon. I'm really excited about next week's sermon because for 12 chapters, we've been going through the book of, or the Gospel of John, and it seems like Jesus comes up against opposition after opposition after opposition. And we, we read here, and I'm only going to touch on it just right now. I'm only going to touch on this just a little bit. It says, because on account of... Him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. This is amazing, guys. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday for this church. Because the next story is where they go and get the palm branches and they lay them down in front of him and he rides the, the cold in to Jerusalem. And that's phenomenal. We are real close to the time of his death in this, in this book. And, and we have several chapters left. So we're about a, less than a week away and there's a lot of detail of that last week right here in John, the Gospel of John. But now let's look at this. I want to do a real quick review, really quick, in the last chapter 
we saw Caiaphas. And Caiaphas was very self-centered. He was the, the uh, chief priest. He was a Sadducee. Uh, they didn't believe in um, the sovereignty of God. They didn't, they didn't believe in a lot of things. But he was the chief priest and he was a Sadducee. And, and in the last chapter, Caiaphas did what was expedient. He said, you know, we have to do what's expedient to save our country and our position. So Caiaphas decides, in, uh, and if you haven't heard this sermon, please listen to last week's sermon. But Caiaphas decides that in order to be expedient to save his country and his nations, that they should kill Jesus. And that way the story went, everything that Caiaphas was trying to save, he ended up losing. Because in 70 AD, the Romans came and surrounded the city, and uh, Caiaphas lost his position and his nation. They were, you know, and they were scattered amongst the nations from that point on. Well, the reason why I bring that up is I see a connection between Caiaphas and Judas. Because they think the same way. They're pretty self-centered. But what I want to do is highlight to you this morning the contrast between Mary and Judas. Who do we want to think like? We want to think like Mary. You definitely don't want to think like Judas. Okay? So we want to think like Mary. Now they think very differently. According to Judas, Mary is not being practical. She is not being expedient. She is wasting this oil on, on Jesus. So Mary's doing something very erratical in, in, in this story. And impractical. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. But we want to strive to be like Mary, not like Judas. And let me tell you why. Mary loved Jesus. Judas loved money. That's the difference between the two. Mary's devotion was solely on Jesus Judas' devotion was on money, things of this world. And that was a big difference. Look at this. John chapter 12, verse 3 says, and Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. In the other Gospels, it talks about Mary anointing his head with his oil. I just believe that John goes in more detail because either this oil run down to his feet or she anointed his feet as well. But here's the thing. She is at the feet of Jesus with this oil, anointing his feet and, 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 and wiping her hair, wiping his feet with her hair. Don't try to Google that, okay? Because you get all kind of oil products for your hair. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so anyways. Um, but this is a picture of service. This is a woman at the feet of Jesus, completely exposed, completely submissive to his authority, to who he was, and just trying to do something for him. And when you look at love, and, and today I think we don't understand love. Love is doing. Love is service. Love, if you love somebody, it's a service. It's, it's how you act, how, what you do. And uh, when you look at this story, did Mary expect anything? From Jesus? No. It wasn't in her mind. It, 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 you know, it's the way the story reads. She wasn't doing this to gain some kind of position in heaven. Here's the thing. Jesus had already done something for Mary. He raised her brother from the dead. And that's what I look at us is, He's already done so much for us. He's raising us from the dead to be alive in Christ. And when we bring our oil to Christ, and when we anoint Him with our oil, it's because of what He's already done. Don't do it for what you can get in the future. Do it for what He's already done. 
Because you're happy and you're gracious to what he's done. But why was this so impractical? In Mark chapter 14, verse 5, it says, For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, that they criticized her sharply. Well, so this oil was so costly that they could have sold it for 300 denarii. In Matthew 20, verse 2, there's a proverb that said that this guy was paid a day's wage which was a denarii. So if you sell, if you could sell this oil for 300 denarii, that's a year's salary. Because if you, if you look at the Sabbath, they, don't, they, they work six days, we work five. Okay? But they had a feast and different things off as well. But it's about 300 days that they would work in a year. So if you make 15000 a year, this bottle of oil was worth $15,000. $15,000. Or if you make forty or 50000 a year, that's what this bottle was worth. And that's a lot of money. You think of it. Um, so if Judas was serious, then this would feed a lot of the poor. It would go a long way. Uh, but Judas thought differently. Uh, Mary had the good intentions. But here's the thing. Notice in Mark, it says, and they criticized her sharply. Not just Judas, they. They criticized her sharply. In Matthew 26, 8 and 9, it says, and when the disciples saw it, they were indignant saying, why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. In Mark 14, 4, it says, there were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was this ointment wasted like that? Well, I want you to notice, John identifies Judas as the one that comes out and says this. And I believe this is like that bandwagon thing. You get somebody in a crowd that says, hey, we should do this. And then other people's like, yeah, you're right. What are we doing? Why are we wasting this money on Jesus when we can feed the poor? So I believe he was the instigator in all this. But there were more than just one. Now, I don't think, I don't think it was all the disciples. It could have been. But Jesus quickly straightened that out. And he says what Judas' intentions were and what, what, that they should leave her alone. Now, John chapter 12, verse 4 and 5 says, But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, he who was about to betray him said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? In John chapter 12, it actually gives the name of the one that said it. And the other ones were thinking it and probably murmuring it to themselves. Uh, but it seems like there's always a Judas in the crowd. There's always a Judas out there getting ready to start things up and go in the opposite direction of what we should go into. Um, but let's dive into the story a little bit. Let's think about how much money this is. You know, we all know we got a leaky roof. Our roof is going to cost about 12000 to replace. So what's expedient? We've been saving for about three years, I'm guessing. We've got half of that saved. So if Jesus was here right now, would it be expedient or practical to use that $12,000 on him or fix the roof? I mean, you've got to think about this. Put, this. put yourself into the situation. Jesus is there in front of them. And this is a huge sum of money that she breaks this bottle open for this one-time use to fill, his, to fill the room with fragrant oil and, and to, to anoint him with oil. And I say, we have to do, and I believe the Word supports it, and we'll, I'll show you why, 
We have to do what most glorifies God with what we have. And I believe at this very moment, what Jesus is saying is, you only have me for a little while. Leave, the, leave her alone. This is what glorifies me the most at this moment. Because he says, you always have the poor that you can go feed. So the practical thing would be, in Judas's eyes, to go feed the poor. And we know that that wasn't his design. He wanted to reach his hand in and take the money. But Mary's idea was to worship her Savior. And that's where she had her heart set. I mean, could you imagine having, and, and, and not everybody, I mean, just about everybody, we're, we don't, we're not loaded with money. We don't have money falling out everywhere. But if, if you had twenty or $25,000 bottle of perfume and you broke it open and you used it one time, that's something. That is a lot to do for Jesus. And, and she didn't expect anything from it. And I believe that that type of love is displayed in this story for us to have the same love for him. For us to do that same self-sacrifice for him. So, I'm going to ask you some questions. What do we live for? What is the purpose of life? What is the meaning of life? Here's three big questions. What is the meaning of life? And many won't even ponder these questions. Most people today never ask, what is the meaning of life? Because you'll look at it and you'll say, well, is there an answer? There's probably no answer. I don't know what the meaning is. Or, or if there is an answer, I don't know. Or is life meaningless? I'm going to ask you that. Is, is there a meaning or is it meaningless? Now, if we don't know the answer to this, we're going to drown ourselves in stuff. Because there's this empty hole and you have to drown yourself in entertainment sexuality, pornography, drugs, nightclubs, whatever there is out there that can take away this empty hole because there, to some people there seems like there's no meaning in life. And you go chasing after the wind. Now, I'll ask you another question. Is what consumes your time, is this your purpose in life? What, the thing that consumes the majority of your time, is this your purpose? And we're going to get to what the Bible, what the real purpose is. So, you would think, okay, here's some things that might consume your time. Work. Work can consume your time. Is this your purpose and meaning in life? Well, uh, I mean, we're told to do a good job for our boss. We're told to... To put our all into it. But this is not your overall purpose in life. You'll find out. I retired from a job. And I thought the Air Force was just going to crash and burn when I left. But they're still there. Well, actually, they're still there because they had to hire me back. They're like, we're going under. Please come back. No. Is your children your primary purpose for being here? And some say yes, and, and, and they do consume a lot of time. But they do leave, hopefully. They'll eventually leave the house. Maybe. <laughs> so what happens when they leave? Are you now in this position of destitute where you have no purpose in life? Um, video games. Some people today, believe it or not, a video game is their purpose in life. And if they ever get the game over, oh my gosh, what do I do? You know, game over. Uh, there's a couple others. Your spouse and your family. 
Spouses have passed away before. And what happens when that happens, if it happens to you? Is that your purpose in life? And I'm not saying that these things aren't important. I'm just saying that this is not your overall purpose in life. Uh, because when any of these things go away, then your life has no meaning or purpose, and you are scrambling to fill that void with something. And the number one thing, if you w this is why I love the old confessions of faith. In the West Westminster Catechism, the shorter catechism, the very first question says, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is, and I think we all know this, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Now, I believe that's what Mary was doing. She was glorifying God and enjoying Him. And that's our purpose, is to glorify God and to enjoy Him. Now, her sister Martha was doing her job which was staying busy like she was in the other story. You remember the other story? Martha comes and says, well, why is she not helping? And Jesus says, you're busy about all kinds of things, Martha, but Mary chose the better. She chose the better. So I'll ask you, what glorifies Christ in your life? And uh, Mary did glorify God. And I believe that when she poured that oil out on Jesus, it never entered her mind anything else to do with that oil. I don't think Mary sat there and figured up the cost of the oil and said, well, if I do this with this oil, I can do all these things over here. But if I do this with the oil, I can just anoint Jesus. I don't think she did that. I think she wanted to give Him glory and praise, and she poured that oil out on Him. And uh, verse 6 says, He said this not because He cared about the poor, but because He was a thief. And having charge over the money bag, He used to help Himself to what was put in it. There's your spark. The spark that starts fires, Judas. Judas. He's over there rousing up the disciples and, and saying, hey, why don't we use this money? We should have used this money for something else. Well, why, why does he want that? Because Judas loved money and the things of the world. He betrayed Christ for a sum of money not too long later. He loved money and the things of the world. And Mary loved Jesus. That's the difference. John 12, 7 says this, 7 and 8. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. So, here is. Do you, do you ever smell things, an aroma that reminds you of your childhood? Maybe a, a bush that's blooming that you had by your house or a certain type of flower. I mean, these things bring back memories. You know, you, you, you smell the spring rain that comes in. In the Bible, it says that the offerings that, that come up to the Lord are like a sweet savor unto Him. His Son is about to die on that cross. And Mary is anointing Him with oil. It says in Revelation that, that our prayers that go up to Him are a sweet savor unto Him. And it's a, in a bowl. It's up a, around His throne. And He hears them. So she's doing something similar here. But Jesus says, In the poor you have with you always. I don't, believe he's not, I don't believe He's saying, Don't feed the poor. I don't believe that. You see, you could take this and spin it a political direction. I think what He's saying is, I'm here right now with you. You're always going to have the poor. But I'm here right now with you. And I'm only going to be here for less than a week. And then I go to my cross. And, and, and she has chosen the better. Now, feeding the poor does glorify God. So in a sense, you see how Judas twists this around? 
He, he's like the devil because he twists this around because feeding the poor does glorify God. God said, you know, um, love your neighbor. But God also said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. You see, so, so feeding the poor does glorify God. Deuteronomy 15.11 says, For the poor will never cease from the land. Therefore I command you, saying, You shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your, to your poor, and to your needy in your land. I mean, we have all kinds of stuff today. We had the war on hunger. Well, I mean, <laughs> we still have poor people. Oh, we've had operation in hunger. And we still have poor people. Now, that's not saying don't stop. That's just saying that we're always going to have poor people. Uh, we've had a slogan that said, wipe out hunger. John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 17 says, But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in needs and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Okay. Here's, here's the thing, though. There is another type of food and drink as well as physical food and drink. Um, John 6, 26 and 27 says, Jesus answered him and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. 635 says, And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. So we got two types of food. We got substance. First John says, look, if you see your brother in need, and it's also in James, if you see your brother in need, just don't say, bless you, be good, go away. May the Lord bless you. No, it says, if you have something that you can help out, give it to them. But I'm telling you as well, it's the same with the gospel of Christ. If you see someone destitute and needed a gospel, give them that food of Jesus Christ. Give them that drink of Jesus Christ. It's both. It's both feeding physical food and it's the spiritual food of God in Acts 6 1 through 4 says that they had this problem there's a story they had a problem they were feeding the widows remember that story and and uh some of the widows were being overlooked and they weren't all getting fed and in there it says there it says it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables so they went and they found seven people. I think it was seven. Yeah, seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom to do that job. So what they did was they did both. They took care of people and they preached the Word of God. They did both. And not just anyone, because the Word said seven good men, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And this brought me to thinking. There was a church around 2011, 2012, 20,000 member church that canceled service on a Sunday, a weekend there, so they could go out and minister to the poor in the community. They canceled their church service to do that. Now, I don't know if they were right or wrong in doing that, but I was looking at the Word and I was thinking, aren't there six days out of the week where we can feed the poor? And one day devoted to God. And shouldn't we continue that church service? I think I would have continued to have church on that, on that Sunday and try to encourage my, the, the flock to go out the other six days. Because it's just as important to, to give God glory and praise like Mary did as it is to feed the poor. Um, I'm almost done here. This church has been blessed beyond measure. We have something that a lot of you don't see. 
uh, some of the ladies in the church give out backpacks to the children at the school. And uh, this was provided to us free of charge. And they go and do this. And now coming up on Wednesdays, uh, there's going to be a, a meal for the children that they can eat for free here on Wednesdays. If you look around, this building itself was basically given to us. The building. These speakers, I think they were given to us. The soundboard was given to us. The pews, I think they were given to us. The furnishing in the church was given to us. The chairs downstairs, as ugly as they are, were given to us. <laughs> the tables, it was funny, Allison asked to borrow a table for a graduation. They saved McLean on the back of the tables. She's asking to borrow the tables she gave to the church for a graduation party. They were given to the church. A baby grand piano that no one plays was given to the church. This thing is heavy. If somebody tried to give us another piano, I'd be like, no way. <laughs> but if we glorify God and don't expect anything in return, he gives us a lot of stuff. And he takes care of us. You know, I was thinking about this story as I'm closing. John didn't pour oil on Jesus. Peter didn't pour oil on Jesus. Mary did. That was Mary's way of loving Jesus. We all have different ways that we love Jesus. It's not all one way. It might be uh, mowing the church lawn. It might be greeting people at the door. It might be spreading the gospel. It, I mean, there's probably a million ways that you can love Jesus. But love is service, is doing. Love is not, it, uh, it, it, it has action. And I'm asking you, what is your oil? Because her oil had great value. Great value. Or is our oil just <laughs> some cheap Stetson cologne that, that we could get? At oh, boy, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> what is, what is, uh, anyways. <laughs> Old Spice? No. Um, anyways. Avon? I don't know. But anyways, what is our oil? What is our value that we're giving to Christ? Is it just a token of something that, that's meaningless to us? Look in the Old Testament. When they gave a sacrifice to the Lord, it had to be without blemish. And it was the firstborn. Not, not just some raggedy old oh, That one can barely walk. Let's give that one. No. It was the best they brought to the Lord. Uh, and now let me ask you, okay, so Jesus says you will have the poor with you always, right? Anyone who, the way Mary poured out the oil on Jesus, she was a servant of Jesus. These people, the people that we have amongst our church and amongst our community, he said, when we do it to the least of these, you've done it to me. When you do to the least of these, you've done it to me. So I'm going to close with these two verses. Matthew, Matthew 26, 13 says this. As surely I say to you, whenever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Wow. I mean... Wow. I don't know if there's a better picture of a person loving Jesus in the Bible than this. At his feet, with a very expensive bottle of oil, wiping his feet with her hair. That is love. But another picture.
picture of love that is in the Bible that is greater than that is John 11, 35, 36. We read it last week or a week before. The shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. The next verse says, Then the Jews said, See how he loved them. And I told you a couple weeks ago, if Jesus weeping demonstrates his love, how much more is shedding his blood demonstrate his love for you? So, that is love. Mary is a story of love, but Jesus shedding his blood for you is also love. Let's pray. Lord, help us be like Mary and not Judas. Lord, show us the oil that, that we have in our lives that we can pour out to you. And Lord, don't let us try to hang on to it. Let us give it freely, not expecting anything in return, but being gracious for what you've already done for us. And Lord, um, we just thank you for the love that you've already poured out for us on the cross, the blood that you shed, the tears that you shed. Lord, we thank you for that. And there's no oil that we can give. There's nothing that we can give that can match that. But Lord, out of a willing heart, let us give our glory to you. Let us give our praise to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.